This podcast is brought to you by Midwinter. These guys were a startup, an entrepreneurial startup some 10 years ago, way before it was even cool to be a tech startup, and have since then gone on to win every single award year after year after year when it comes to financial advice software. I use them. Um, I know a lot of people that have, and if you haven't already jumped onto the new way of doing business, which is all cloud-based and API, so it all talks to each other, then go look at yourself in the mirror and sort yourself out and go get Midwinter. Welcome, Stu. Great to have you here this morning. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, Stuart Bell from Ordinary Co- uh, Consulting. Um, we're super sorry. It's a it's a bit of a tongue twister that one. I'll be practicing the Ordinary part. I didn't uh, I didn't do the uh, con- the consulting part, obviously. But um, super excited to have you here, um, talking about you know scaled advice and uh, and how we can all build leverage in our businesses. So thanks very much for joining us, Stu. Thanks very much for having me, guys. I really appreciate the invite. All right, great to have you. So, Stu, can you just give us a um, – just before we get, get into the, the questions, which we're, we're keen to, to chat to you about your recent trip and um, some of the philosophies that underpin your, the work that you do, um, can you tell us a bit about how the thought process behind starting your business and what, who you work with and the problems that you solve? Yeah, of course, of course. It's interesting. I wanted to start off with a really – quick story because Aldera is one of those names that um, it's just people have no idea what it's all about and I was actually in uh, San Francisco with Naomi Christopher who's on the line and I think we had a few beers and I just turned around to her and said Naomi you're a, you're a marketing guru you, you know your stuff what's the number one thing you do and she said change the name and I was like well, I, can't, I can't change the name because I really love it she said well you've got to explain to people what the hell it means and the answer uh, to that is uh, it's, it's actually a Latin word and it means to, to dare to risk to venture or kind of to do something different. And uh, when I was looking to kind of start my business, and I'll tell you the story in a, in, in a brief second, it was about sort of crashing together two worlds, which is the world of advice, which I've been, I had the, the pleasure of working uh, in the field of like practice management for about 15 years now, but also crashing together with some of the experiences I had uh, in the tech startup space. Because I think, the opportunity within that intersection is just, it's just massive. You know, digital advice, whether you've got robo advice, which I hate the term, or whether you call just moving like advice businesses into engaging clients in the ways that they, a lot of people want to be engaged these days, it's going to solve a whole bunch of problems that, uh, that a whole bunch of people are having right now. But um, give me the you quick just, and dirty. Hey, how you pronounce it again, Stuart? Because I think that, yes. I just heard you pronounce it before and that was not how I was saying it to people. Yeah. It's a lot of people say uh, or dare or, uh, but it's actually the thing. <laughs> when I, I was grew, I grew up in Australia, but it, uh, I went back to the UK when I was thirteen, and one of the things they forced me to do is learn Latin for two years, um, which is at the time seems completely useless. But when you learn when you re- when you learn a bit of Latin, you realise it's the root to everything. And Latin's really easy; it's just pronounced exactly the way it's spelled. So our dare is completely uh, phonetic, which is a dare. Okay. How dare it? Yeah, um, and like it's the root word of audacious. If you like, if you know what I mean. There you go. Useless bit of information. Um, my background: I've been doing working in the field of practice management for about fifteen years. Had a bit of a come to Jesus moment in about two thousand and seven, walking through an airport in Melbourne. Uh, off the back of that, decided to take a year off. Travelled around. Best thing I ever did. Never met anybody who said, "God, I wish I hadn't travelled as much." Um, and while I was away, I realized that I wasn't, uh, I hadn't fallen out of love with the business side, the coaching side of thing. I'd actually fallen completely out of love with the corporate thing. So I got involved in being an independent coach. And in about 2012, I, as I, as I, I've got this habit of going and working uh, with businesses completely outside of my industry. So I had an experience in 2012 working with a national fitness boot camp brand. Then in 2000, uh, late 2012, I was looking around talking to a whole bunch of people and a good friend of mine uh, had actually just come off the back of selling his startup business to Yahoo for about 40 million bucks. Uh, and he turned around and said, Stu, you've got to get involved in the, in the startup community in Sydney because there's some really smart people doing cool things. And as often happened, had a bunch of coffees, met with a guy, met with a guy, met with a guy, and ended up getting involved as a managing partner of a startup business called Corporate of Freedom. And it was basically an incubator. But rather than incubator focusing on, you know, 22-year-old coding gurus or, or whatever, we actually focused on corporate employees 
who had been in corporate for a period of time and had realized that it wasn't for them and wanted to get out, but they had sort of commitments which would stop them from just jumping out. And we, yeah, went on this journey, worked with some really super smart people. One guy was a seed investor in PayPal back in the day, uh, Susie Jacob, Paul Dunn, uh, Brian Scher, who's an absolute marketing guru, and learned a lot about how Silicon Valley sort of starts these businesses, apparently from a standing start on a shoestring, uh, and then grows them really quickly. And off the back of that, I just, I, I, I came back into the industry and looked at sort of some of the models that were prevalent and just thought, we, we've got to do something, we've got to change it. Um, got to get more agile, nimble, all that sort of stuff. Ended up writing a book about it. Uh, but off the side of that, I realized that I actually didn't want to sort of play in a generalist coaching space. I wanted to play specifically in this tech innovation and leverage place. And that's pretty much been the last two years. Uh, wrote a book, started a program, all that sort of stuff. And, and yeah, it's been, it's been an absolute blast. Awesome. So I'm really study trip. What were the yeah. key takeouts that you got from that? And what are the key learnings that you think, you know, people in the advice community can, can take away and look out for? Yeah, I, I, I was very surprised and lucky to be invited to go to the US with the implemented portfolio guys. Uh, so, uh, Matt Heiner turned around and said, speak to Santi Burridge, who I'm, I'm on a webinar with on Friday, actually. Um, and they said, yeah, come to San Francisco. And uh, I, I honestly, I said to Santi when I caught up with him this week, I said, I'm actually still trying to digest it all because it was just four days of 25 meetings with startup businesses, with, uh, you know, um, venture capitalists, consultants, and a whole bunch of uh, advice firms out there. And it's still just percolating. But... I think the ones, the trends that I've taken back with me so far are probably the first one which really hit home and I think a lot of people on the line will take a lot of heart from this, which is one of the largest independent firms over there who, if you take the US market's about 33 trillion, these guys own about 2 million of it and they are probably the closest you get to an independent firm in the US. Um, but they, for years and years, since about 2008, have gone with this marketing campaign of Wall Street is broken. You know, advice is conflicted. And you know what? It's been, as you'd expect from Americans, the marketing angle has just been fantastic. But uh, they've, they've obviously made a decision now that that kind of stage of their marketing is over and done with. And the, uh, the angle they're going after is the link between financial well-being and personal well-being. So this idea of not seeing wealth creation as something that sits over there, but something that influences your spirituality, your well-being, your health, and all the rest of it. And I know there's a lot of people in the industry, uh, particularly you know, the younger advisors out there who do strongly believe in this angle. And I think to see a large firm like that going off that health and wellness space, they're not, they're not making this decision based on, hey, what do we do next, guys? Lunchtime meeting, let's do this. There's research that's gone into it. There is testing. There's online stuff. There's focus groups. So that's a real trend. I think we're going to see an increase in... Uh, you know, businesses positioning their services being part of a bigger health and wellness thing. That's probably the first trend that I, that I saw over there. Um, the second one, which I think is really interesting, is the clearest indications of that model was a group called, uh, you need to get in the closet, Adrian, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, is, is the fact that I think the future seems to be more likely to be the combination of these two things into businesses that have more impact and do things at a, at a, at a lower price point. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll choose one more, uh, which is one of the guys we met over there was a guy called Richard Arnold. He sort of blew my mind. But some of the challenges he laid out is he asked questions around uh, uh, looking sort of 20 years in the future. How will advice be given you know, 20 years from now? Will it be, you know, Ben's digital avatar, talking to me as your client, digital avatar, and we exchange information, which goes, that's the kind of thing that, that Silicon Valley are kind of thinking about. Uh, right. He challenged people to say, you know, going forward, how will one advisor, if one advisor can manage 100 clients now, what does a business look where an advisor can manage 1,000 clients and the experience is still off the charts? Or alternatively, you know, what does your $50 um, advice program membership look like? And I think... The one trend and the one thing I myself and a couple of others on the tour got from it is if you're still thinking about advice as just being you doing stuff, then shift over to thinking about how am I going to create a system underneath me 
that delivers all the value that I do, but it's not dependent on me and my personality and my efforts and all the rest of it. So there's a whole bunch more that came out of it, but the, those are the three things that have really captured my imagination and are kind of fueling a lot of what I'm doing right now. Yeah, awesome. So I'm keen, I'm keen to explore a, a little bit uh, in, in some of those areas. The, the first one was you'd mentioned the health and wellness space and the example of the company over there. Uh, that have that have moved into that uh, area, and I know I know a couple of um, great businesses over here that are sort of moving into that space. Space, uh, Catherine Gross down in Sydney, and and Lee Shadell is doing this really well. Uh, yeah. I think, but for people that have have thought about it, and like you say, I think a lot of people can see that there's that link there between the you know the overall wellness and the financial wellness. But what did they give you any insight into the approach that they took, or uh, were you able to glean any sort of yeah, I suppose tips for someone that wanted to go down that path potentially? I think a lot of uh, what's going on in the space is kind of um, they're employing a lot of personal financial financial management tools. So we know them as the money soft, the money brilliant, that sort of stuff. But uh, there seems to be a greater integration of this stuff. So they're kind of, uh, and I'll, I'll give you a really clear example of personal capital uh, that are a firm and they've got a really clear engagement funnel. So they offer a bunch of uh, what we call calculators, tools, financial planning stuff that people can come in and use. Um, you know, and they're free. The next level up is they offer analytics, which is where you can pull together, you know, your data, your information, uh, kind of some of the stuff that we're moving into, but I don't think we've systemized it and kind of centralized um, a lot of the, the reporting and, and the information there. And once you've got it all there, they can start to sort of pull out some of the marketing elements and deliver articles which are relevant to you. Because one of the, one of the speakers over there was a group called Splunk. And the guy who came into the room was just, you know when you talk, you get to about five minutes into talking to someone and you just realize this guy is just off the charts brainy. Yeah. He was talking about the amount of data that just doesn't get used. So they're talking about, once you've got people's data there and you're analyzing, you know, what are you spending your money on? What are you doing? Um, you can start to sort of deliver content which is really relevant and some of that is going to be health and well-being Some of that is going to be little nudges around, you know, why are you spending your money there? Why are you doing this? Um, one of the things that personal capital run in the background is Something called a what-if scenario generator Which is it just runs in the background. It'll shoot you through an email a month going Did you know that if you didn't spend, you know, 200 bucks a month on this? garbage you'd be this much better off in 20 years oh, and, right. and that's automatically happening so and then eventually you lead into you know you put your hand up and say can i have a chat with somebody and then that leads into advice and then that leads into ongoing management and that sort of stuff so yeah, i'm um, curious do you see that as being something that would actually happen for advisors as well so it would instead of going out to the client actually notifying advisors of what they should be watching out from a risk management standpoint I reckon it, I, I probably could. I reckon uh, when they, I've worked on the coin implementation AMP a while ago, and I reckon a lot of the reason why you know coin was chosen that kind of thing. Like you until you said that. that. <laughs> <laughs> you know that was the original idea. You know they could analyze a lot of what was going on, pick up these trends, and I know the the guys over at Encore Group were working on something similar. So yeah, there's no no reason why not. And. I mean, from, it'd be interesting from my perspective, you know, if you had a bunch of uh, businesses that were working together and sharing business data and, and all that sort of stuff, you could probably point out business issues along the way. So, yeah, cool. Okay. So, kind of bring the whole thing round. Um, there are sort of technology that's bringing it all together and kind of trying to ha engage clients on a, on a sort of whole situation and then go a bit deeper using the data. But at yeah. the moment, I'd say the health and wellness thing is primarily a way of connecting with clients and bringing them into into our world without having to you know without having to, to lecture them on financial literacy or give them a glossary of terms they need to learn. So I think that's the predominant angle being backed right. up. Nick. Okay, I like that interesting approach, and it and it seems all all, uh, all hinged on technology as well. It um, does. I won't go. I think you've given us a good wrap on the robo, but. Um, the other thing that you talked about was process driving and systemizing. So I'm keen to explore this, but, w but what, what I also wanted to ask you, and I think this links in to your approach when you, w that you take the businesses that you work with through. So can you, um, yeah, maybe give us a run through of, of the approach that you take when you're working. You, you, so I come to you today and say, look, I want help to leverage my um, time and my firm. What's the process that 
you, you would go through typically. Okay. The first thing we need to understand, Ben, is we need to understand uh, exactly where you're spending your time, what you're doing. And if you speak to the average advice business owner and you analyze the tasks underneath their role that make up their day-to-day, -day, their week-to-week, -week, their month-to-month, -month, there'll be anything between 60 to 120 tasks that they do on a regular basis which, which keeps their business running. And each of those tasks is a system. Now, uh, you can break them down further. So some advisors will turn around and say, you know, I create a newsletter. Well, in actual fact, underneath that, that newsletter heading are probably six or seven tasks. You know, I source the content, I write the content, I format the newsletter, I proofread it, I put together the graphics, I mark the list. And the further you can break it down, you suddenly start to realize that in actual fact, there are some systems which are dependent on knowledge, but the majority of them are, can be mapped out one, two, three, four, five, six. So the first step that we do is do what we call an activity audit. So we do a brain dump of every task you do, for your marketing tasks, your new clients' work uh, activities, your ongoing client activities, your admin, including managing your email and calendar, the stuff you do for managing the financial aspects of the business, the stuff you do for managing your team, the stuff you do for technology. At the end of it, you're going to have these six big lists. And then what we need to do is work out what's the stuff that's kind of your, to quote Dan Sullivan, your genius. The stuff that if you did more of it, your business would progress. And on top of it, it's stuff you love. You know that, that feeling when you're doing something and you get your head down, you look up and three hours have gone past? That's the stuff that you love. So we'd mark that with one color. And the next step is we go through and ask a question that if time, resources, and money were no problem, what's the stuff that you could potentially find someone else to do? And I'd mark that with another number, uh, color. And then we, uh, we'd go through a process of time coding it. So I ask the question, what's the stuff that happens daily, weekly, monthly? And what we're looking to do is we're looking to start small by selecting, say, two to five processes from the, the, the daily, weekly, monthly end. And our goal in the first 60, to 60 days is we're going to try and get those out of your bucket and put them into someone else's bucket. Okay. At this point, the next question comes up is how do I do that? And you've got four options here. You can either eliminate. That is, you look at what you're doing going, there are bits of that I just, I'm doing because it's habit or it's inefficient or frankly, it's just not delivering any value. So we eliminate either by culling, simplifying or just stopping it altogether. The second option you've got is automate. We go out and find a tool to do it. Edgar, meet Edgar is a really good example of that. You know, uh, if you're every time going on and posting every week on Buffer or whatever it is, well, Edgar's a tool that you can take all your library content and put it into there and it will automatically posted on social media for you. So that's an example of an automation thing, as well as you know, workflow software like Kissflow or um, various different things. X.ai, have you guys seen that? Uh, I've heard of it. I'm about to sign off for it. It's this uh, automatic robot that you CC into an email when you need to organize a, a meeting and it will jump in and basically look at your calendar and, and interact as a human being. Wow. So a lot of people can't tell it's a robot. Anyway, so that's another example. So Eliminate, automate. Uh, the second thing is you just learn how to delegate it. So you get really, really better. That's uh, really, really better. That's not even English. I get really, you work out, right, there's someone else I'm going to get to do it. And I've just got to work out the process for delegating it. Or the final thing is you outsource it. You find someone out there who's better. Now, eliminate and automate are pretty clear. But then the challenge comes that if you try to delegate something you're outsourcing and it's stuck in your head, uh, it's just going to make it really hard. I think Bill Gates made the comment. He says, if you add more people to an inefficient process, you just make the problem worse. So yeah. the easy answer is you've got to find a way of getting it out of your head into a format that someone else can follow. And traditionally what you do is you sit down and you write this operations manual and it would take you weeks or months or hours. Then you do what happens to every operations manual, which it goes in the drawer, gathers dust for three years, and no one ever looks at it. But um, yeah. The, the process I've been working with businesses is, is leveraging video. Now, I, I learned this trick because I work with people overseas and yeah. I do a lot of coaching meetings, so I don't always have the time to organize a catch up, sit down and explain things to them. So I learned pretty quickly um, to sit down, record a video of what I want to done and then email it out to them. And suddenly I found it as a better solution because they could go back and watch the video time and time again. And on top of that, I could then 
follow it up with a message saying, you know that video that I've just shown you how to do something? When you've worked it out, could you actually map it out into a checklist so the next person can watch the video and do it again and again? And we follow a really simple formula called the system for designing systems, which uh, means that everybody who maps a process, it's almost like a, it's almost like the genesis. It's a process you can go, here's a process on how to map a process in our business. And it gives them like a, a recipe to follow. And wow. uh, the end result is it suddenly gets to a situation where you're doing something anyway. You know, I'm already putting together a proposal or I'm already check, uh, fact checking or sorry, proofreading a document or I'm already setting up my social media. I may as well click record, uh, yeah. on, record a video and then I've got an instructional video done forever. And if you can get in the habit of doing that, over time you suddenly find yourself, particularly if you can get the team behind you, mapping these processes, putting it onto you know, an online operations manual like Sweet Process or Process Street, you suddenly find yourself six months later opening your online operations manual and seeing all of these processes just sitting in there. And people okay. come to you and say, how do I do this? And your default answer becomes, you know the best place to find out that information is go and look at the online ops manual because it's going to explain it to you much better than I will. And if they come back and say, I've looked on the ops manual, there's no process there, you go, congratulations, I've got a project for you. <laughs> uh, yeah. And the whole point of this exercise is to, is to elevate you because uh, sort of put a line under it. A lot of business owners, they start their business and they're doing everything. Okay. Is that useful? Yeah, no, that's good. I love that actually. Um, that's, I really like the, the structured approach to doing this. Can you just tell me this system for designing systems, is this something that you've created or is this like something we can read in a book? Uh, it's actually the guy who gave me the idea and I, I'm really careful to attribute other people's ideas wherever I get them because I think it's the right thing yeah. to do. Uh, there's a guy called Jack DeLosa from the okay. yeah. I, I was uh, I worked on the entourage for about six, six months. I was uh, yeah, uh, a person, personal man, a participant, thank you. And uh, yeah, that was a system that sort of he passed on and said, I mean, they had everything from literally a photo showing where the post office in the CBD was. That's how detailed they went to. And I reckon 80% of really successful uh, entrepreneurs who've managed to scale their business, you ask them about, you know, where are your processes? And they'll tell you pretty quickly, Here, here's where it is. They're just, they're, they're uh, fastidious about mapping things as they go. Yeah, no, I like that. This is something that I try to do in our business and I've done a lot. I've got a, um, a couple of guys offshore that help out with things as well and I noticed that the screencasting and recording is something that, like you say, you can just, uh, you can do it at, if you want to do it at 8 o'clock at night and you want to show them a particular process that you recorded, it's on there and they can watch it when they log on or whenever their you know, time zone permits. So, totally. Did, um, I did an experiment. You can do the experiment too if you want. If everyone demonstrate the power of video to someone, uh, I think it was about nine months ago, I was running a workshop. Uh, we had this two people. I said, here's the deal. I meet your bow tie, like a proper bow tie. One of them had the list of instructions with photos on it. The other one had access to YouTube. I said, you've got to learn how to tie that bow tie and said, go. And the person with the video absolutely killed it. Yeah. It so much easier to watch somebody uh, show you how to do something than it is to try and read how to make it happen. And if anybody wants to see this in action, uh, there's a great startup, it's not a startup anymore, called Khan Academy, K-H-N, K-H-A-N, and they're applying a lot of this theory to the education uh, field, which is ripe for disruption. Two or 300 year old model that is totally broken, but uh, yeah. yeah. Awesome, no, I really love that. Look, uh, I've only got halfway through my questions and I'm sure we could, Sorry, chat, I'm we could sure. chat all day, but I know that Adrian's got a few that he's keen to ask as well. Just before I turn it over to him, though, Adrian's going to ask a few questions for the next 10 minutes or so, and then we're going to get to uh, questions from, from the guys watching in. So anyone that's watching in, if you've got a question, something that you, you'd like to ask Stu, um, just type it into the chat box. Just make sure you select that you type it to everyone and, uh, and, and we're going to get to those questions very shortly. Deborah mentioned, so I'll pull one out. Deborah mentioned calendar organizing. Just want to catch that quickly. I use Calendly, Deborah, uh, but X, it's x.ai. There is a waiting list for it, but I think they're just about to use the professional uh, thing. It's, if nothing else, it's a great talking point when, when you reveal to people that they've actually been talking to a robot. <laughs> cool. What are yours, Adrian? Great, Stu. 
Awesome so far. Like, I'm really big on um, making sure everyone gets some hot tips when they come in and um, watch XY, XY Live. So those, those, um, those technology tips are awesome. I, I'd be interested with, um, with what you saw in the US, things that people can do now. So like just, just linking that relevance in terms of like obviously everyone's got to get their business process oriented and know exactly what the steps are in how their business operates. But are there any things that people can do that you, you're concerned that businesses are doing now that um, are probably the most things to be fearful of? Um, and I'm not talking about um, the general robo fear, just things that they can prepare in terms of um, the new technology that's coming out. Yeah, I wrote an article on this actually just yesterday for Rubico, and it was all about do robo does robo have advice. If I really want to start on this journey, I'd probably be thinking about just grab some small tech integrations and start down that route. I think uh, calendar booking, like Calendly, is just a really easy way of kind of showing clients that you are open to this kind of stuff. Um, I think you know, tools like Energy, the knowledge. How many? I mean, do you guys you guys heard of Energy in the Knowledge Center? Yeah. That's a really that's a really good way of offering something to clients at a relatively low cost. And whether you do it through something like Rob's solution or you go and build your own member's site, but offering something that says to clients, here's a resource that you can use to engage online, which is full of content which is relevant to you and, and good stuff that's been created, that's probably a really good place to start as well. Um, probably the I was gonna pull one thing uh, that I've kind of been pretty passionate about and I just noticed so well in the way that startups do, which is if you look at the way that startups go after their market, they look, they get really, really clear about who they want to talk to. Um, and then rather than going out with a, you have to be financially literate or you need a budget or you need to get insured, their first aim is to connect with an existing problem. Um, they're not trying to sell the, you have to do this at the top of the funnel. They're trying to get them to connect with stuff that people are already looking for. You know, I'm looking for a simple solution for that. I'm looking for someone to bounce this idea off, whatever it might be. Um, and I think as the benefit of that is it enables to open the conversation, to get the email and start the marketing process, which typically when you're marketing to people who are not aware they have a problem, which let's face it, um, when it comes to financial literacy, you know, few, very few people wake up in the morning and go, I don't know anything about anything. I need to speak to someone else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, if, you, I think if, if, if the one thing you could do to get on board with this stuff, I think if you just, businesses started getting clear, clear either on the market they're after or the, the, what they believed in the message they had, mm. and instead of trying to educate and, and sell to them at the top of the funnel, instead just try to work out what are they already looking for? What's the problem? So to quote your, um, I think Ben, you mentioned it, you know, what's the existing problem that you're trying to solve as opposed to the whole bunch of 10 problems that these guys don't know about that you're trying to open their eyes to? Yeah. Um, can I give you one really quick example? Sure. There's a business in the US called Levanto, which I think means levitate in, in Spanish. And they are a personal financial management tool with a kind of an online component. And they started off, they launched their business, and theirs was all about, uh, they target what's called Henry's, which is a great acronym, High Earners Not Rich Yet. So I think we, know, we all know what we're talking about there. Yeah. Um, and they went out with uh, their original value proposition was get financially well. But they discovered that their target market didn't think they were financially unwell, mm -hmm. which kind of sort of talks to the fact that if you're trying to market to people about a problem they don't really feel they've got, it doesn't work. So they pivoted and they changed their position to we are your personal bookkeeper. But they then went out and asked the market and they realized that the market kind of saw bookkeepers as someone... Um, Someone that has to be managed and told what to do. And these are time poor people. So they pivoted again and they came up with a, a value proposition which was we are your personal CFO. You know, we're someone who will give you direction and leadership. And that's what they're going with right now. And I think, you know, we can talk about plugging in tech, we can talk about adding in all these tools, but I think the number one thing that uh, advice firms can do to get connection, get engagement and, and get in particular online is just start listening to what the problems are already there and talk about those and hook into those as an opportunity to get the conversation going. That's a very long answer to a, to, to a short question. That's a great oh. answer. Gee, that's awesome. The, the other, I guess the other curiosity, and guys, a reminder, um, Naomi, Naomi just said Levanta was the, was the highlight of her trip. So, so good. 
Yeah. And that, that the guy who presented, which I think his name is Doug Chen, was just an absolute. You just saw him. He he'd been at Google. You just knew he knew what he was doing. He was such a good pitch. That's awesome. Daniel, thank you. <laughs> no, it's, you, you, you're welcome to to extend your answers as long as you're delivering the the hot stuff for us. It's. Uh, <laughs> I'd be curious to know. Like, there's a lot of advisors that are starting to do different um, tweaks to their business in terms of stepping outside <laughs> uh, traditional financial advice. So, for example, life coaching. Um, uh, health and wellness. What yeah. uh, do you think that's essential for businesses? Because because uh, people are wondering, is this is this overreaching what their scope is as an advisor, or is this something that's necessary for us to be more relevant to clients? That's a good question. I, um, my gut, my gut is to sort of come back again to whether or not you're doing something because it's what you want to do, or whether you're you're doing something because it's something your clients want. So you start, I think you start with the end client in mind uh, and let that kind of guide what, what you want to be doing, then you're going to get traction. And at, at some point you realize that the direction your business is heading isn't, a, isn't genuine. It's not what you're good at. It's not what you love uh, and your passion is somewhere. Then the answer is go and find another tribe. Go and find another community that doesn't match it or just stop doing uh, those kind of things. So I think if you're going to go down the health and wellness route, and you're going to leave with that angle, You've, it's got to be something that's genuinely you. Like if I turned around and started to... Uh, you know, I, 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 on the beach surfing, so surf lessons and uh, financial advice sort of thing. Absolutely, because that's him. It's genuine. I mean, like, it's like XY. If you guys suddenly turned up on this webinar wearing uh, ties, cleanly shaven, and all the rest of it, it would be a bit weird because that's not what XY is about. And or that's or not, in, a, in an office or something. That, that in an office. Anything like that. <laughs> Um, the I, you know, I think the greatest thing you can do is if health and wellness is your thing and you can find a tribe you can connect with who believe the same things you do and have the propensity to pay you the fees that your model requires, then go for it. But if you find yourself going down a route where it's, you know, it's not your thing, you're only doing it because you're going with the crowd, you don't really believe in it and you're, you know, all your business model is too expensive for the client, the client that you're going for, then I'd, I'd definitely revisit it and ask whether you're just doing it because it's a trend or whether you're doing it because genuinely you feel it's something you can add value in. But yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. I had, I, what, I, what I got out of that was essentially, um, yeah, to start with a client and you mold what they need um, and that's how you can branch out, but um, it's got to be at fixing up concerns for the client or needs. Um, and otherwise, if you feel like living um, by the beach, um, you're going to have to make sure your clients uh, match your what you want out of your lifestyle or how you want to do things. So yeah. As long as the match is going on, is that is that the is that the hot that's, pretty, that's pretty much the hardest thing to do is try, to try and create a market for a product that you have, unless you've got deep pockets. And all the marketing people will know you can you know, if you want to create a market for a product, it's expensive. But the easiest way to create a like create demand is go and look at the market see what people are already looking for and kind of hook into that. Um, I mentioned Peter Davison, who's one of the speakers on Corporate to Freedom. Uh, you know, this is a guy who went over in the 90s with a, a bunch of money he'd borrowed off friends, started calling himself a venture capitalist, invested in a whole bunch of startups. One of them happened to be PayPal and obviously uh, came good. But um, having seen him in action, he used to start million-dollar businesses. Like They weren't, didn't start off as million-dollar business, but he sold three businesses. By, and he'd, he'd start work on a Thursday and the business would be up and running by a Monday. And he didn't do it by going, I've got this great idea. This is what I want to do. He'd go out and go, what are people looking for? He'd do a bunch of research, Google AdWords, what people are buying, scrape data from eBay, scrape data from Amazon. At the end of it, he would have found a hole. Um, the best example I can think of this is there I got, there's a guy who, about five or six years ago, was trying to buy CB radios online. And he realized... I'm trying to buy a CB radio. I can't buy one anywhere. And sure enough, he went and found a whole bunch of other people who were trying to buy CB radios. And guess what? He set up an online store selling CB radios and boom, absolutely killed it. And that was just because he had a passion. He identified there was a gap. And next thing you know, he's got a business. That's the easiest way. And that's part, part of the secret as to how Silicon Valley just, just does this. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Benny, how, how, are we, how are we doing for time? Like I, I could go all day uh, yeah. just extracting all the good stuff out of Stu. That's a yeah, I think I think uh, we've got we've got a couple of questions that have come to the audience, but we might uh, we might just answer those uh, before we wrap. I think um, that's us. 
you know, with the health and wellness thing, one thing I think that why that works, and I think you're talking about taking that to the, like finding that need and taking it to the market. I think everyone is generally becoming more health and wellness sort of focused these days as well. And I think that's why that works. Not to say that you need to do it, but um, I think that's why people partner in successfully in that space. Um, there's just a lesson. Lesson. Sorry, go on. I was going to say, there's a lesson in there for us to take from, I think, the fitness industry as well. If you think about the fitness industry 20 years ago, it was, you know, boxing gyms and gyms on the side of tennis clubs and all that sort of stuff. And then some, they corporatized it. And all these people became personal trainers because they thought it would be this awesome nine to five job where they just got fit. And they realized that actually it's really hard work. And the smart guys in personal training are taking to the next level. They've created group programs and CrossFits and online stuff. And I think if, if I look for sort of leadership from any industry, uh, it's, I reckon, some of the stuff that f the fitness industry have done in making fitness and wealth and health being an essential. I reckon if we follow that model and go down that route, we won't be too far wrong. Yeah, awesome. Um, cool. So I've got a question, a couple of questions from uh, the guys watching in. We've got one from, from Mark uh, about robo advice, and um, it sort of speaks to, I, I suppose, the question of where is the line between, like, is it just advisors using technology efficiently or? When does it cross over from being efficient to being robo advice, if, like in your view? Uh, I'm going to answer the question, I think. I know Mark quite well. Um, I, I, look, I think it's all about where, how the clients want to engage. That's the whole thing. And we, we've got a whole generational change which is coming through, which, and I conclude myself in that, who mm -hmm. are very, very comfortable with our first step being an online engagement. I don't pick up the phone when I'm online. I might fill in a form. I want to get. It. I actually sometimes prefer to get that first contact back via email. Um, yeah. you know, I prefer to get the first elements of value delivered in that way. Um, you know, 20 years, like 15 years ago, the idea of putting your credit card into an online store was kind of like it was like giving giving the keys to your house to a bunch of 14 year old boys and say have a party. Um, but nowadays, everyone's super comfortable with it, and I actually think robo advice is more about the fact that. There's a generation of people who may not want that first contact to be, I have to come to your office and sit in front of you and go through what perception or no perception is seen as a, as a spouse appointment. I'd rather engage with you, download your stuff, sort of read your blogs, watch your videos, maybe have a 15 minute chat on the phone, maybe come to your webinar, come along to a workshop. I want to experience your value. And if part of that is by you've got the system whether it's the astute wheel or whether it's map my plan or whether it's any of these tools that I can come on and say, you know what? It's not just you as an expert telling me what I should do. You've got a system that you're managing over the top of it and I can engage with you in a way that's non-threatening. I kind of think that's what, what robo advice is. It's adjusting our engagement model to suit an increasing um, desire of the population out there not to have, to have that face-to-face -face contact being the first thing. And I think it's a good thing because you know what? I don't think you want to have sit down and have a face-to-face -face meeting with a client who's just trying to work out whether you're the right person. Yeah, absolutely. Let them let them pre-qualify themselves and uh, and then come come when they're ready to to talk. Hundred percent. When the, by the time they come to you, you want them sitting in front of the guy going, Ben, uh, Adrian, I know what you're all about. I've read your stuff. I know how you work. I know your system. Now I want to talk about what you can do for me. That's the yeah. conversation we want to be having. Absolutely. Cool, and last question I've just got here from Jenny Pierce. I know you've mentioned a few apps already, but what's the best app that you use daily? Easy. We're putting you on, uh, you have to be easy, okay. I'm gonna give you, any of you the top one, I'm gonna give you two others, Jenny, if you don't mind. Voxer. Microsoft Outlook. Microsoft Outlook. I use Outlook on my phone, it's on my iPhone, would you believe it? It's the best email app there is, it is would you believe it? Like, it's so good. Let me okay. tell people. Forget Apple Mail, forget any of it. Use Outlook, they're like on an iPhone. Anyway. Uh, the best app I use is an app called Voxer. And this is like, it's called a, an audio walkie talkie. So I think it's about $4.50 a month. I get my whole team on it. Uh, and what it does is it eliminates the need for me to write long emails. Because sometime when keyboards were invented, some, someone came up with the idea that let's all type everything out. Like if we go back to the 1950s, Gender inequality aside, they had a really good system, which was they had people who could touch type, and they had people who could do, uh, what's it called, shorthand over here, and then they had the people who couldn't over there. And they worked together in order to 
work efficiently. And then computers were invented and suddenly we all went to, to typing. The average person can speak at 200 words a minute, that's the one fell, 200 words a minute and types at 40. Which means whatever I can say, I'll be done in 20% of the time than you typing. So Voxer is great because whenever I'm speaking to the, I wanna, whenever I wanna give sort of in, uh, instructions or get people to send things out or do tasks, I just Voxer it to them. Uh, and it's a really great way of just removing that need to have emails going back and forth. I also, I use it with clients. So I come to the end of a coaching meeting, I'll pick up Voxer, I'll do a summary. You can send out a URL link, which goes into an email, and they can actually hear an audio summary of, hey, this is what we covered, this is what your job is next time around, and etc. So Vox is probably the, yeah, awesome tool. The other two I'd recommend are, I bought an iPad Pro with a pencil and uh, an app called Paper 53, and it's just changed the way that I take notes, the way that I keep track of things in client appointments. It's... Uh, yeah, incre absolute game changer for just note taking and mapping out like processes and sketching worksheets and all that sort of stuff. Paper uh, 53, is it? Paper, it's, I think the, the app is called Paper and the company is called 53. Okay. Uh, I'll just pop yeah. it on the chat there, guys, if you, if you want to check them out. That's it. And the final one is a tool called Rev.com, which is a transcription service. And uh, one of the things I try and get anybody who comes on the leverage program uh, over to his file notes on on, Voc, on Rev because uh, yeah, as again, you can file notes are, are incredibly important for your business, but notoriously, what happens is you have to wait until you've got time to sit down, and then you got to usually it's a few days after the event, and you got to try and remember what the context was, and you, all the time you're moving away from that appointment, you're losing this really great quality information. And Rev enables you to dictate an audio file note. It automatically uploads its Dropbox. So literally your, your team can be picking it up, dropping it into your CRM, actioning the, the, the actions off the back of it. But the real tweak is you can hit a button. It goes off to a pool of transcribers who will transcribe it out for you. They'll shoot it back to you usually within a couple of hours. Uh, so if you really need a written file note, you can then just copy and paste it and dump, dump it into somewhere. And I've actually started writing sort of articles and all sorts of things uh, on it because Funny thing is when you dictate blogs, they end up sounding like you. And when you dictate emails, they end up sounding like they're coming from you rather than that formal stuff. So hmm. those are probably the three I, I use regularly. Voxer, uh, 53 I use pretty much every day, or paper by 50 feet, and Rev is, yeah, it's a, it's a store walk. Well, the main, the main reason for that is 40 words, uh, 40 words a minute versus 200 words a minute by voice. So I think... Yeah. That's, that's how, did, how did I know, Stu, that you wouldn't be able to pick one out? Yeah, that's kind of, yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, I'm, I've, I've actually noted out, I've got about 10, so I'm not, uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. And they, I, yeah, I, I think the general rule for apps is if it's not making things better, faster, or easier, then don't use them. Absolutely. Awesome. awesome. Well, well, look, just think, the link yeah. into the next session. Sorry, Benny. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so for everyone watching you, there's a link to the next session in the chat box there. Adrian's just just put it up. And if you guys are anything like me, I know that I struggled to write down all of that stuff. This session, the recording from the session will be going live onto YouTube in a few days' time. So keep an eye out for that. If you're not already subscribed to YouTube, to the XY Advisor YouTube channel, if you do that, you get a notification when this stuff pops up. Um, guys, and the, thanks and the very much. will be coming out in a, in a few days as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, thanks very much for joining us, Stu. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate your time. Guys, we've got um, a great session next Wednesday, same time, um, just to play catch up. We've got Sam Henderson. He's going to talk about profile and, uh, and how he ended up on the TV. So um, you can register through the link that's in the chat box there. Uh, as always, tell your mates if you think uh, someone would get value from this. So thanks, yeah, thanks everyone for watching in. Thanks again, Stu. And, Can I just uh, a quick plug, because uh, Phil Thompson wrote this great article on LinkedIn just the other day, all about yeah. uh, sort of diversity and some of the experiences that so he's seen. I think it was a really brave article to write. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to sort of recognize him for, for putting his neck out and writing it. And uh, I think the message that he put out was excellent. So nice one, Phil. Nice one, Phil. And guys, I've just put, um, you can look up Stu's business as well. I've put his li a link to his business in the chat box. He's got a bunch of tools and 
um, different webinars and stuff that he runs that'll that'll give you guys some value. So have a look around um, and check check out some of his stuff. I've had a look and it's quite cool. So there's a downloadable sheet there called uh, the R five top productivity tips, which you can download. Pop your email address. You know the sort of deal. Uh, and they're the, the five tips that we reckon will save you if you implement them well. So you, scroll down, it's right there. Awesome. Cool. All right. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, and yeah, look, look forward to seeing everyone next week. Thanks, gents. Have a wonderful yeah. week. And uh, thanks for having me. No worries. Cheers, Stu. See, See you. Later. Later.